Well, welcome everyone. Great to see so many of you here. Um, I'm Roland Leiker. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, visual politics event with uh, professors Lydia Choliaki and Miria Georgiou. Um, this is, as always, a hybrid event. Um, we have uh, an interview with Lilia and Miria for about half an hour, um, and afterwards we'll open up for questions and for comments to everyone. And I'm here down the hallway with Cormac Octobeck Wilson, my co-host. Um, Cormac is in the very, very final stages in the last couple of months of his PhD uh, on the role of protest photography, a very, very uh, wonderful conceptual uh, thesis that he's finishing at the moment. Uh, but we're here to talk about a co-authored book that Lilia and Mira wrote together called The Digital Border, Migration Technology Power which came out just recently, 2022, with New York University Press, and an absolutely wonderful book. Uh, Cormac and I had, had extreme pleasure uh, reading it and dissecting it uh, in preparation for today. So, so massive congratulations and uh, welcome again. I was wondering if you can start off, uh, Lilia and Mira, by just asking you a little bit to, for, for context to explain sort of how you came about uh, writing this book, it sort of it was triggered a episode by the refugee crisis in Europe. Maybe you can tell us a little bit what got you going, what got you collaborating, and how it, it all uh, came about. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both uh, Cormac and Roland, of course, for this invite. It's wonderful to be in this forum. And this is a wonderful program of uh, hybrid lecture, so it's an honor for us to be part of it. Um, you're asking what generated this book. And of course, the, the main generative force behind the book is migration. And of course, not migration as merely the, the movement of people across boundaries, not the movement of people across boundaries per se. Rather, we have both been intrigued, but also, of course, troubled by the way that migration has become such a hugely politicized uh, uh, topic uh, currently. Politicized and of course, highly mediated topic. And now we see migration shaping both public imaginaries and social order across the world. We know of course how governments and how especially uh, extremist and right-wing parties are using migration as a core element of their politics. So only this week you might have heard that uh, Europe's foreign minister said that Europe is a garden and the rest of the world is a jungle and the jungle at any point is ready to invade the garden. So we are seeing narratives of migration that present it as a, uh, present it as a threat, as a crisis out of the ordinary becoming now normal. And next to those uh, that normalization of the narratives of migration is out of the ordinary as a crisis, we also see a disproportionate compared to other public funding, a disproportionate investment in technologies of surveillance and a control of the mobility of people who do cross the borders. And these include investment to technologies such as drones, but also transnational databases. We see uh, technologies of surveillance um, and technologies of control of migration that spread across screens and on location that present to us constantly migration as a problem. But of course, we're not only told that migration is a problem, but we're told that migration is a specific kind of a problem, a problem that more significantly threatens white, Western and Christian societies. So uh, at the peak of the so-called European migration crisis, both Lily and I came across um, the intensification of those empirical observations that in many ways speak to some of the fundamental questions that we have been asking in our work from different perspectives and individually um, in the work that we have done over many years. So most importantly, I think the aim and the, and the drive, the conceptual drive uh, behind this uh, research was how communication technologies mediate asymmetrical, asymmetrical geographies that connect people but which also unequally distribute power, technologies of mediation, which assort people between those who have the right to move, who have the right to, uh, uh, to resources and the right to rights in our Indian uh, terms, between those that can be shared and should be shared and those who uh, uh, should not. <clears throat> 
So uh, uh, this context of the uh, migration crisis, always in quotation marks, of 2015, our collaboration emerged quite uh, organically, and actually we were lucky enough to get support from our department to get involved in two rather different projects that somehow are reflected, I think, in the structure of the book. So we were supported by our department to go at, uh, in 2015 at the outer border of Europe in the Greek island of Chios um, to, uh, to observe and record some of the dynamics among the actors of migration, the people who were engaged in receiving um, uh, migrants um, uh, at the time on the island. At the same time, um, as a department, we worked collaboratively with colleagues and students on a rather different project. So we went to location and we went on the screens. The second project was a collaborative um, uh, analysis of the European media and the European press representations of the so-called migration crisis. So we ended up having a, a, a pool of amazing data both from the screen, media representations of the migration crisis across Europe, but also those voices and those observations of the actors on the ground. And these were uh, the initial material that we used uh, to start this project. And uh, Lily might want to uh, come in and add um, your thoughts. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I just wanted to say that everything that Miria said, of course, that's the bigger framework, but just about my own uh, participation because I'm not really a migration scholar as such. So I, I really followed uh, Miria's lead uh, on, on a lot of research strands in this book. Uh, so I, I am, I define myself as a scholar of uh, mediated vulnerability. So I'm interested in human suffering as a problem of communication, how we represent bodies in pain, uh, on paper or on screen, what are the histories of these mediations? What are the contemporary debates about them? and also what the implications are of mediating suffering for those who are mediated, the represented, but also those who produce representations and for those who witness um, um, the, their pain from, from a distance. So for me, the book falls broadly within this broad problematic on, on migration um, as of, of, of uh, mediation, uh, because I see migration as among many other things, of course, also as a form of mass suffering, of mediated suffering. Um, now, this focus uh, was eventually extended and it was complicated by our fieldwork material and together um, these different forms of data that we ended up collecting pushed us to think about the bigger question of what the digital border is and what it does in the present moment. Um, what does this mean? And just one last sentence from me on this. It means that even though my own entry point uh, was micro -repre migrant representations in the media, the project that Miriam mentioned was a kind of a the starting point of the of the of the of the book, um, the project in its entirety um, got me going with a deeper exploration of migration, not just as a form of symbolic power, power that has to do with discourse and with representation, language, image, etc., but as an intersection of the symbolic with other forms of power geopolitical, biopolitical, uh, necropolitical, all these different um, uh, forms of power and acts of bordering that we mentioned in the book. I'd like to pick up on um, Maria's opening image about the garden and the jungle, actually. I saw you know, the responses in the media and so on, um, as everyone was very shocked and couldn't understand you know, how someone had sent, said something like this. But in your book, uh, you talk a lot about binaries and the key role that they play in relation to migration. Um, so often the migrants are cast as deserving or undeserving, victims of threats, entrepreneurs or parasites. But as you also show, the relationship between these binaries isn't straightforward and it's not static. So I was wondering if you could explain to us how this dynamic functions over time, but also over space as one moves from you know, the outer border into the European city? Yeah, yeah, that's a very, very good question, I think. I mean, absolutely, there's already research, substantial research across fields, you know, for media, migration studies, uh, international relations, that has established um, this binary and the harms that it performs amongst others, you know, Roland and Emma's uh, work here um, has been very influential in that respect. 
Um, and the key point here is that um, the media representations of migrants is divided precisely in those two dominant uh, positionalities. Migrants as either victims, powerless, inactive, no agency, uh, or as threats that is dangerous to us uh, in terms of cultural coherence, in terms of, you know, there are terrorists, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in the digital border, we saw how these positions alternated depending on context and time, context in space and time. Um, and, 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 and the time frame that we examined is um, the July, November time frame uh, during the 2015 uh, migration event in Europe. So um, early on um, in that time frame, news representations adopted what we might call a cautious or watchful tolerance towards migrants. By September 15, and, and, and particularly following the photo photo photograph of, of a, of a three-year-old boy found round in a on Turkish uh, shore, this reluctance, and I'm sure we all remember that, turned into what we call an ecstatic humanitarianism, an unprecedented uh, wave of compassion um, towards arriving migrants. Two months later, um, in November 2015, following the Paris attacks, um, the humanitarian sensibility um, was overnight replaced uh, by suspicion and hostility. Migrants were now a source of terrorism and nothing else. Um, so what does this enactment of the binary shows us? We argue in the book. It shows us that binaries are actually linguistic technologies of power that position its reference within specific discourses. And here um, it, we're talking about an orientalist discourse of migration. So victim and threat, in other words, are not so much opposites as they are nodal points to use a kind of discourse theory termed by Laclau and Muth, um, that shift and morph according to context and stabilize the meaning of the migrant in line with the power relations and hierarchies of that context at that moment. So whether they are called victims or threats, uh, migrants in our news discourse across time are systematically orientalized. They're classified as less than human and as others than us. Um, so this is the basis really of our critique of media discourse as a symbolic border. We argue that news discourse offers us the resources to talk about, to represent migration, but these resources at the same time reproduce colonial stereotypes and uh, permanently keep migrants outside, if you like, the scope of, of, of normative humanity, Western humanity. I was wondering if you can perhaps uh, come back to an issue that both of you flagged at the, the beginning when you made your introductory remarks, and that is, in some sense, the core conceptual parts of your book, and that is sort of the process of digitalization and, and the role that plays in, in framing, in enacting, in politicizing the, the issue of migration. You sort of speak of something that's happening on location and on the screen at the same time. It's sort of a different binary, uh, if you want, and your entire book is divided into two parts a part that deals with the territorial border and a part that deals with the symbolic border. And in your introductory remarks, you sort of talked about all these networks of mediation that sort of link these elements together. So, and obviously there's issues of power, there's issues of representation, issues of mediation. So I was wondering if you like to perhaps elaborate a little bit more on why you ended up with this structure and how that's become central to your argument uh, as you advance it in the book. Mm. Shall I start? Um, that, that was in many ways, again, um, a structure, a conceptual and uh, a representational structure of the book that uh, to which we arrived, uh, I think, inductively and through some of the observations that Lily has highlighted already. So um, 
uh, going out in the field and collecting different kind of data, but also, also reflecting in relation to how uh, migration, the mediation and digitization of migration is is um, is uh, discussed in the literature. We saw that very often we we see research that divides its focus between a binary about how we think about uh, digitization and migration. So on the one hand, we have an extremely rich rich uh, literature that looks at how uh, the state apparatus and its policing of the border is increasingly using uh, digital technologies to control people's uh, movement and to govern uh, uh, bodies and uh, and populations within racial orders of of uh, mobility and then we see another kind of very rich literature that focuses on the media representations of migration and how we see um, uh, we see uh, conceptions of migration constructed on the screen. So in, in many ways, there has been a, a long-standing divide, which of course has to do with the genealogies of scholarship between location and the screen. But actually inductively, and I think through our collaboration and through the different expertise that each one of us uh, brought to this project, and because we studied both people and text, uh, because we were interested in both screen and on location within that context of asymmetrical and interconnected geographies, it became apparent that there is a continuum. Um, Lily mentioned already the nodes within the frameworks of understanding uh, migration of the binary. So we see a continuum of systems of power that involves territorial power, that involves symbolic power, and how the two are intermingled constantly and how one creates the other. Uh, fits into the other. And, and in our framing, and I will invite Lily uh, uh, to, to, to come in now, but in our framing, we thought about how to conceptualize and understand in a meaningful way uh, this continuum by thinking of the networks of mediation and to think about how the different networks of mediation bring together those different spaces uh, to shape the regimes of power and their unequal distribution that we see in the context of migration. Um, yeah, no, I mean, um, exactly. I think the term um, uh, continuum here is, is key. Um, the digital board really um, tries to capture the current reality of a much older process. And that's the process of dividing spaces and people in terms of an inside and an outside. Um, now, this is a process of controlling the movement of people from one territory to another, let's say, you know, the, from one nation state to another or within the nation state, what we call the territorial border. But it is also um, a process of controlling the stories we tell about those people on the move and of the process of bordering itself, what we call the symbolic uh, border. So what we are arguing is that this process of control is today thoroughly um, um, digitized. Um, the, the, the quality of the digital uh, brings together the territorial and the symbolic in ways that make the continuum denser, subtler in its control um, applications, but also more pervasive than ever. And the name we give to this continuum of border controls is, um, we call it um, a techno-symbolic assemblage, uh, precisely in order to capture how the power relations of the border are enacted through, um, always through configurations of technology and meaning. Uh, data processes, biometric assessments, institutional databases, mobile phone interactions, social media networks, mass media narratives, and even the face-to-face, -face, the chats in the cafes. We think that uh, we need to consider to grasp them all in their totality within a continuum of techno-symbolic um, uh, relationships. Um, of uh, controlling the inside and the outside. Uh, but the term assemblage, uh, as I have, I think, just hinted at, also shows how these configurations of the border operate across space and time. They link, for instance, a small island at the outer border of Europe with Interpol data banks that enable AI-based um, identifications of every migrant. And we, we have developed a vocabulary to talk about the horizontality and verticality of those networks in terms of remediations, intermediations, which is exactly what I just described right there. 
a border control um, uh, point uh, in Kios connects with a, a kind of um, a data bank somewhere in a, in a Western European um, uh, nation state. Um, but, but those technologies also de-link and disconnect, or people have the ability to de-link and disconnect them. For instance, when WhatsApp groups um, among humanitarian NGOs, again on the island of Kiev, established messaging networks to create hierarchies of activism, and this is what we describe in the um, uh, humanitarian securitization chapter, for instance, uh, where those WhatsApp groups somehow included some actors in the coordination efforts of, of, of um, supporting migrants in their arrivals, but kept others out. And so created uh, those uh, kind of rings of hierarchy amongst them. Um, um, yeah. yeah. There's lots of things that I'm keen to follow up on. There's so many sort of important issues that you bring up, but I was wondering if I can just ask you to kind of elaborate on one particular issue that is what role does visuality play in that process of digitalizing the border and the whole you know you talk of of networks of assemblages and of course in the program here visuality is one of the key themes we discuss and you have an entire fascinating chapter on visibility and responsibility uh, in news imagery and and you know the kind of chapter i know i will keep coming back and back back again for the kind of uh, things you do in it in part because you sort of say we need to go beyond the kind of notion of the conventional critique of news images of migrants. You know, we all know that they tend to be portrayed as passive victims, as void of power, that they're kind of new colonial um, uh, aspects involved in these visualizations and that we need to decolonize uh, in many ways these images. But you say news media is a lot more complex and, and you talk about assemblages that are always more complex, that have, have always different entry point, different exits point. So, so we just came because many of us work on visuals, if you can elaborate a little bit more on on the role that visuals play, because they're not exactly the same as digitalization, but there's links between visuality and digitalization uh, uh, going on. So, yes, 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 exactly. I mean, one way in which to approach um, the symbolic work of the border in terms of um, separating inside from outside is to ask um, what are the key words that proliferate in in public discourse, and and we did exactly that when we looked into. Um, the, um, the news um, uh, discourses that circulated um, in, in selected countries in Europe um, about migration at, in that time frame. And one of the words that um, proliferated at the time was uh, the word responsibility. That was on everybody's lips during the 2015 migration event. Maybe perhaps just to say, you know, more generally, the ethical way of speaking about migrants in liberal discourse evokes the idea or the norm of us having to do something about it. We need to be responsible, we need to act on their plight, and we need to be hospitable or not, or whatever. And so this became our starting point, uh, one of our starting points in the study of the symbolic border. Um, um, we kind of turned that moral imperative of, you know, we need to show responsibility on its head. And we asked what exactly does responsibility in this context mean? And, and how is responsibility represented or better enacted in European news discourse? And, you know, with news discourse, we focused on, on visualities as well, on, 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 on photojournalistic images of the border. And so our analysis of 80 front page images from five newspapers from five European countries in the three moments I presented earlier, um, focused on two things, on how migrants appear on the photographs and who appears to feel and act with or for them. So our assumption there was that why responsibility is an abstraction. And so I might say, well, it is unrepresentable. Um, what can be represented is model actions, if you like, that are themselves informed by dominant ethical norms of what is the right thing to do in that particular photographic scene. And so um, from this starting point, we then uh, went on to identify five such norms of responsibility, and they were responsibility, for instance, to just monitor the news. 
to feel for the suffering of uh, migrants um, in their dinghies or arriving um, on the shores, um, tired and, 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 uh, um, and, and, and afraid, to be reflexive about their predicament, to prioritize national protection, or to protest in their name. Now, all these are well-known practices of what, among others, Roger Silverstone in, in his book, Media and Morality, calls civic responsibility, right? Uh, or uh, which is a, a, what he says, um, a, a form of responsibility that we can also call formal responsibility. This is what is expected of us to do as citizens of a liberal democracy. But these practices at the same time again, systematically represented migrants as generic figures, as victims, you know, the discussion we had just earlier, as victims, as threats, um, uh, more than that, as objects of our reflection, which is a variation of them being victims, or as a cause of our activism, right, which is a refutation of them being threats. But um, they were um, in neither, in, in none of those visualities where they uh, represented as human in the way we are human, as figures, in other words, of unique um, individuality. And I think here um, is pertinent, the, you know, the quote by Hannah Arendt from the human condition that we include in the book is one of my favorite ones, uh, when she says that um, who somebody is or was, um, we can only know by knowing the story of which he is himself a hero or they are themselves a hero. And this is exactly what is missing from the, our, our news discourse. Um, it is this quality of, of migrants being the heroes of their own stories. Um, to put it in another way, what is missing is the quality of uh, what, again, cover of following around calls narratability that can lead to an alternative form of responsibility, not formal civic responsibility, but what again Roger Silverstone calls substantive responsibility. And this is the responsibility, um, not that we have towards one another as uh, citizens of a, of a polity, but it is the responsibility for the condition of the other which we take to mean responsibility that prioritizes the other in the, or the understanding of the other in their own terms and caring for their predicament while treating, treating them as, as fully human. So that's what the argument was trying to uh, articulate. We might have time for one more question Fantastic. before we open it up to everyone So. Mm -hmm. um, so while I was reading this this argument you just you just reiterated for us, I was in complete agreement, right? But when I got to the end of the chapter, I was like, "But how, what does this look like in terms of you know the news as an industry?" So, for instance, um, photojournalism is closely bound to discourses of objectivity and so on. So, what happens when um, you know we make the shift that you argue for and migrants start representing themselves? And the stories become um, about you know these sort of hero narratives, um, but also what about the news as a commodity and sensationalism and so on? Um, yes. Would these sort of photographs be able to be front page photographs, and would they attract consumers? And would the news as an industry um, be compatible with this sort of approach? Yeah, I mean it's a very good question, and I think it's an ongoing kind of. Um battle, uh, or, you know, around media representations. I think in general, it is hard to imagine media re and representations and narratives otherwise, because we are all inhabiting the same, what we call in the book, crisis imaginary about migration that we also tend to analyze. And so the limits of the imaginary can easily become the limits of our own imagination. But I think, you know, we both think, I think in the book, we have to be able to imagine otherwise. We need to challenge that crisis imaginary. And I mean, there are two points that I would like to make specifically with respect to that. One is the news uh, could and should use more individualized stories that um, present migrants as narratable selves, uh, much more than they do currently. I mean, the narrative trope of individualizing generality 
is well known in journalistic reporting. And we've seen it in Ukraine. Miria is now working on, on, on the new kind of um, uh, migration and refugee event uh, from Ukraine. And we can see the difference in reporting. And maybe she can tell us a little bit more about how these differences uh, present themselves in terms of narratability, right? So that's one thing, but we don't see that with all migrants from every part of the world, but we see it with European migrants. They are more individualized. They are much more humanized. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the second thing is that we need to also uh, look beyond the news for genres of humanization and take inspiration from there. Um, documentaries, films, podcasts, art exhibitions are only some of the narrative formats that open up um, spaces um, for um, migrant representations that are very different to the, you know, uh, st new stereotypes. Um, uh, I'll just recall one that really impressed me a few years ago. Um, I saw it in um, at, at the MoMA Museum in uh, New York um, by Bushra Khalili, called the uh, Mapping Journey Project. I'm, I'm sure some of you must know it. It consists of short films focusing on a map of the Mediterranean and then the hands of migrants using markers to draw um, on the maps and trace their travel routes while narrating their journeys. And it was one of the most um, compelling, moving and harrowing uh, artistic experiences we can have. That is one way in which this can happen. Not the only way or perhaps not the perfect way, but one of the ways. Did you want to say a few more words, Miria, about that? Because that's in some sense also links to your kind of uh, methodological uh, challenge of going back and forth between conceptual work, work with migrants, uh, between macro and micro issues. You might want to say a few final words on that before we open it up to everyone uh, for comments and engagement. Thank you. Um, uh, just a couple of words. Uh, I think um, Lily has already emphasized that we all occupy uh, those spaces where the imaginaries of crisis become uh, prominent. And of course, these kind of imaginaries um, create certain kind of order and they create also a transnational kind of order of discourse where we assume that Again, we assume certain roles. We assume about uh, the roles of who speaks with what kind of authority and who uh, and who listens as well. And uh, j just the last point to make before we open the floor, because we have emphasized the uh, how the digital border is a, 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 a powerful regime of um, of inequalities, is that we we have seen also in our research that this regime is always fragile and there is always the possibility of resistance and part of the those possibilities of resistance is precisely when migrants themselves make claims to the right of voice make the claim to right to speak with the authority that they have as storytellers about their own uh, their, their own experience, but also not only in an experiential level, but as political actors as well, as political agents that uh, um, have and should have, because also our book ends up in a normative note, uh, should have the right to be part of these public conversations about what, uh, uh, why migration is a local, national, and transnational issue of concern. And our methodology tried to incorporate all these different sides of the border, the, the networked uh, side of the border, the different ways that it works as a regime of power, but also the fragility of the border that has to do with uh, resistance that comes through representations and comes through experiences of migrants, uh, people who live in cities, activists and volunteers as well. Uh, Cormac and I have at least a dozen more questions that we could pursue, it, particularly on the issue of resistance, which is both something that we both uh, work on. But I think we'll, uh, we'll conclude this part here now. So big thanks, Lilia uh, and Miria, for the interview.